Um, has anyone had an interesting week? Anyone else had an interesting week? It's been a bit of a, a, bit, bit of a week, hasn't it? Um, I wrote down all the things I was going to make reference to at the top of this talk, including this beautiful flowery arch behind me, which is not going to stay there. I don't know where it belongs, so it's staying there today, but probably it won't be around next week, because that was part of the wedding yesterday. And all the things I've written down, I even forgot to write down that there was some election in America. Um, <laughs> Was it on Tuesday? Kind of overnight Tuesday night, wasn't it, into Wednesday? Um, there's something, isn't there, about coming together as a church, um, and particularly when we come to this table later, um, which is a reminder that kind of no matter what's going on, something remains, isn't there? So we're not going to talk about politics or elections or anything like that today, but what we are going to do is we're going to talk about the thing that remains underneath everything else. Is that okay with you? That's fantastic. I think that's really important for our souls as well to do that. Um, we, will, um, we are going to have a two-minute silence um, for Remembrance Day, and the reason that Dave is so tight with his timing is that he's given me precisely half an hour to do what I'm doing, so then we get to exactly 11 o'clock, and then we're going to be stopping for two minutes silence. So this is now a test of whether or not I can do something timed or not. <laughs> and you can check with your watch, and if it gets close to 11 o'clock and we haven't stopped, then maybe give me a wave or something. Um, we're in the middle of a series as a church, looking through the letters to the churches at the start of the book of Revelation. Revelation is um, 22 chapters, but the first, well, chapters 2 and 3 are full of seven letters to churches, and we're the first letter um, in the start of chapter 3 this morning. Um, it's a letter to the church in a place called Sardis, um, and it actually, and this is really meaningful to me, a lot of these letters you kind of read and study and kind of it's a bit out there, but this letter to the church in Sardis somehow or other connected with me when I was a teenager. I don't quite know why or how. Maybe through the Spirit of God, he's brought this to life in my, in, in my heart. And it connected with me as a teenager. And then as a, as a young leader in my university days and trying to lead Bible studies for the first time, this letter has kind of been brought, brought life to me again and again. And I actually don't even, I can't quite imagine that I would be a minister of any description if it wasn't for the message of these verses, if not the verses themselves. Um, and I, I'm going to summarize the talk this morning as this, that your reputation is nothing if you don't trust God today. Your reputation counts for nothing if you don't trust God today. So we're going to read the text together, in two parts, actually, and then you're going to see, you can see if you think I've got the summary of the text right. So let's read this together. Revelation 3, verse 1. <coughs> These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So what do you say is going on here? Firstly, we have this question. Why is Jesus being referred to as holding seven spirits of God and seven stars? It's a bit of an, an awkward image. There's a learning point here for you. If you find a tricky sentence in the Bible, then often the next one will tell you what it means. It's really important. When you're reading the scriptures, find a tricky sentence, read the next one, see if it helps you, or the one before it sometimes. Jesus is holding the stars and the spirits. What does the next sentence say? He, he knows their deeds. He sees them clearly. He sees them properly. The number seven um, throughout Scripture has a, um, has a reputation or as a, as a, as a role of uh, referring to what's perfect or complete or maybe more technically the true essence of the thing itself. Thus, the number six would refer to the false essence or imperfect or deception. But we don't want to get sidetracked particularly by numbers here. The point is that Jesus is in possession of the true and perfect and complete, the true essence of the Spirit of God himself. And we are told in chapter 1 that the stars referred, if you remember from chapter 1, 
that the stars refer to the angels who are the messengers bringing these messages to the churches. So because Jesus holds the sevenfold spirit and the sevenfold stars in his hands, we're reminded that Jesus indeed knows what God knows and speaks what God speaks. His words are perfect and there is nothing hidden from his sight. I think that's what the seven spirits and the seven stars is referring to. And therefore, the second thing we can see from this text is that as a result of Jesus knowing everything, he knows that the reputation and the character of the church in Sardis don't match. He knows their reputation and their character don't match. There is something fake about the reputation of the church in Sardis. Now, I don't believe that it is like, it's because they have tried to be deceptive. But I do believe it's because they are living on past glories. Their reputation has come from something that might have happened a generation ago, and the people today are still taking credit for it. The sacrifices that we made 15 years ago caused this great reputation for us as a church in Sardis, and we're still going to be taking credit for it. They're living off someone else's reputation. And thirdly, so Jesus says he sees that, and thirdly, although Jesus approved of what he did in the past and their reputation is a good thing, he says their journey is not finished. They have not finished the race. They have not kept going. You know the fable, is it an Aesop's fable, the hare and the tortoise? or it's a fable of some sort anyway, the, the, the fable of the hare and the tortoise, that Sardis has started off like the hare, they're, they're char- haring off into the distance. They're, 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 but they're now, I think in the story, he, he ends up sleeping under a tree, doesn't he? There's work for them to do. They haven't finished the race. And in verse 3, we've got this alarm clock moment. They are being woken up. Wake up, strengthen what remains. They need to do something about their sleepy situation. Jesus is telling them in this text, as far as I can see, to remember what got you your reputation and then turn back to that type of behavior. They need to repent, to turn back. Repent of trusting their reputation and strengthen their personal trust in God. And then we come to the second part of the passage. Yet you have a few people in Sardis, I think this is verse 4, moving on. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of the person, of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels." Whomever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the last part of the text is this. You've got these sleepy Christians living off the benefits of other people's faith. We'll just pause for a moment. We'll come back to this, but I think it's important. You have sleepy Christians living off the benefit of other people's faith. To what extent could we describe our cultural situation, even the situation of our church, from time to time as sleepy Christians living off the benefits of someone else's faith? But you have some in your church who are still on the straight and narrow path, haven't soiled their clothes, haven't thrown out their inheritance yet by trusting a reputation. So what's Jesus' promise to them? For the ones who have kept going, and for, implicitly for those who repent and get back on the straight and narrow, what's his promise to them? The promise is that the one who finishes the race, who wakes up from under the tree, who doesn't give up on the journey, that person will be dressed in the white robes of perfection, or maybe best, the robes of glory. And they will be welcomed into the greatest party in history, which we talked about with this white stone, didn't we? How the, He gives us a white stone with a name written on it, known only to the one that holds it. This is a, a reliable ticket to this party. These people will be pillars of hope in the community of the new creation. 
In short, the promise is that they will have something so much better and superior to what they value today that they will be amazed and eternally grateful that they listened to Jesus. So that is our text, um, the letter to the church in Sardis. But I've got three lessons or reflections that might turn into two, depending on how long they take. Um, But certainly these lessons and reflections might help us. Number one is this. God knows your name. God knows your name. If we stop for a minute and have a think about the, way, the, the interactions with people that we have throughout the week this week, or last week, most of the things that other people have done around you this week have been done so that they can be noticed. Most of the things that the people in your family have done maybe that have annoyed you or maybe that have pleased you, have been done so that someone will notice them. People act in that way so that they will be noticed. There's obvious stuff like um, taking selfies in cafes or going to the gym. Or I think I counted eight gyms in Hayward's Heath this week. Maybe, maybe you're posting witty updates to social media or depressed ones this week, I don't know. But it's deeper than that. Most of the... Let's say most of the successful people I know are motivated, at least in part, by trying to impress somebody. Trying to prove somebody wrong, maybe. A a parent that didn't believe in them, a teacher that spoke down to them. Or motivated by gaining some sort of notoriety. Success in school is tainted with this desire to be noticed. Noticed by teachers or peers or parents. Success on the sports field, success in the boardroom, success in the pulpit is designed in part or f- in part fueled by the desire to be noticed. <coughs> but it's not just as straightforward as being noticed. I've got this quote um, by Gwen Stefani up here. Um, she says, I feel like none of it's real, even the good stuff, it's impossible for anyone to really know me. Because it's not just that you want to be noticed, it's that you want to be known. I don't actually know any particularly famous people, Um, a few ex-professional cricketers, but none of you would know who they were anyway, so that's fine. Um, But if you read interviews with famous people, the same thing seems to come back on repeat, something like this. People notice me, but they don't know the real me. If only people could see the real me, then I'd be fulfilled. Notice me, but don't just notice this version of me out here. Notice the real me. Know me. Love me. And this is one of the things that makes the gospel of Jesus Christ quite so attractive. You come to Jesus, and the first thing he says is, I love you. And the very very next thing he says is, I know you. And in the language of this text is, I know your name. It's been said to be loved And not known is comforting, but superficial, collapsing like a pack of cards. But to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. To be fully loved and fully known, deep down, is the greatest desire of every human heart. Now, there's a cool Greek word, I don't do this very often, but there's a cool Greek word that turns up four times in this text, not always translated the same. It's translated as reputation in verse 1, it's translated as people in verse 4, and translated as name twice in verse 5. It's like the English word name, onoma, but the semantic range is bigger than how we use the word name in our culture today. The word onoma refers to the whole of someone's reputation, character, lineage. It basically says who they are. And as we start engaging with this passage, the first thing you notice is that Jesus says, God knows your name. He knows you. You are fully known and fully loved by the all-powerful, all-seeing creator of the universe. But there are many people in church, there are probably many people here this morning who still turn up to impress someone, to be noticed by someone, a spouse, a parent, a child, even a friend. And Jesus is saying, look, wake up. You're sleepwalking through life. God knows you already. You don't need to be noticed again. 
Wake up and strengthen what you value, because if you don't wake up, you'll miss out on what God has for you, both here and for eternity. He knows your name. He knows your works. In fact, in verse 4, there are names in the church that God knows to be following him, living holy lives. These names might not look great to others in the church. Maybe they've made poor life choices years ago. Maybe they've been dealt a rough hand by mental illness or by relationship breakdown. But God knows your name. He knows your works. In fact, verse 4, there are, sorry, the, he knows your works. He knows your name. He sees. He doesn't judge you on your past mistakes. He judges each of us according to the condition of our hearts. Are we leaning into him? Are we like the beggar at the, last, at the temple giving the last few cents? Or are we like the, the wealthy Pharisee giving pots of gold to be noticed? Are we like the tax collector on our knees begging God for mercy because we know we have made bad decisions? Or are we like a professional religious person thanking God that we haven't made the same mistakes? And thanking so loudly that someone else might notice. God knows your name. And that means that he knows your reputation. This is true for everyone, right? He knows our reputation doesn't match our character. It might be close, but for no, no one, their reputation and character is identical. But God knows that your reputation is not who you are. And for some in Sardis, that's a good thing. I have a friend. Um, I'm going to call him. He's on the left here. E I'm going to call him Elam. Because um, this guy became a Christian um, in Iran and was disowned by his family. He lost his job um, in the medical profession. He lost his livelihood. He ran from, or fled from Iran to the west and ended up in England. He's up north. He's a very intelligent, very faithful man who has been treated horribly by people um, in Iran. And then he's been treated horribly by people who don't like foreigners coming into this country. He has no property no money to speak of, nothing particularly going for him. For Elam, the fact that God knows him, the fact that God sees the difference between his reputation and who he really is, surely for him that's remarkably good news, isn't it? And I've put the other person with their back to us, so I don't know who it is. People who are held up as examples of faith in our culture. Famous pastors or celebrities that talk about God from time to time. The wealthy, generous Christians who fund charities and support church plants and give expertise to grow the church. To those people, maybe the idea that God knows their reputation doesn't match their character, that might be a little bit terrifying. The fact that God knows your name will surely disturb the comfortable, and comfort the disturbed. God knows your name, and that truth lies at the heart of what Jesus is saying to the church in Sardis. And I suggest, I might be wrong with this, I'm going to offer this, that one of the first things Jesus would say to Haywards Heath Baptist Church is, if he was writing to us, would be something like that. I know your name. Each of you. And as a church, I know you. You're not just part of some group. You're not English or African or Scottish or male or female or Jew or Gentile or slave or free or rich or poor or wealthy in the eyes of the world or, or abs free from everything. What he would say is, I know you. And the question of whether God knows your name is good news for you or bad news is entirely determined by the shape of your heart right now. Does that make sense? And I can't, I don't know what the shape of your heart is because you've all got reputations. I don't know you. I know your reputation. So I'm not going to pass judgment on you, but I'm going to say that Jesus knows your name, and if that's good news for you, it's because of the shape of your heart, and if it's bad news for you, it's because of the shape of your heart. I think we've said two things broadly so far. Just trying to work out this timing. That God knows your name, 
and he also knows that you're more sleepy than you realize. Let me try this, actually. You're more sleepy than you realize. The letter was written to a church in a small town of Sardis in Asia Minor, what we'd call modern-day Turkey, and Sardis was actually a very wealthy town and incredibly militarily significant. Sardis was able to maintain wealth and security relatively easily because there's basically one way in and out. And so it was reasonably easy to defend Sardis from enemies, and the common perception was that no one would bother um, trying to attack the city. And that had become its downfall. Not once, but twice in its history, the city had been overthrown when a single guard was found sleeping by the enemy. If the guard had woken up, he would have been able to raise the alarm and, and save the city. But Sardis was destroyed or captured twice because its watchmen were asleep. Do we have a reputation for life? Maybe at HHBC we do. Certainly we're very well regarded by local pastors in town, by the Baptist network at large. Our social media says some very good stuff. We preach truth. We teach good stuff in our home groups. We've been preaching truth and doing good stuff for nearly 50 years here. So the question is to us, if we have a reputation of being alive, and I believe we do have that reputation for being alive, are we actually more sleepy like Sardis? And how about you personally? Are you just going through the motions? Are you living off your parents' faith? When was, when was the last time you led your family to make a sacrifice for the gospel? Not just a sacrifice for someone else in the family, but a sacrifice to see Jesus preach to other people. That God knows your name is both terrifying and comforting beyond belief. And my guess is that most of us have a foot in both camps. We sort of have a bit of experience of my Iranian friend, but we also have a bit of the experience of the wealthy religious benefactor. And given the lack of sort of relative persecution in Sussex, not unlike the persecution, that sort of the lack of persecution facing Christians in Sardis, I would guess that most of us, and that's me included, spend more of our lives feeling comfortable in our faith than feeling on edge. I know your deeds. I know your name. Your name says life. But the truth is, you are dead or dying, says Jesus. Wake up. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Fan into flame the gift that God has given you. Pour accelerant on the smoldering embers of faith. Add fuel to the fire because it's about to die. About to die. Do you think that's a bit extreme? Um, I read this book a bit of it, and it wasn't very nice, so I stopped reading it. And then I watched a movie called The Children of Men. Has anyone else cover, come across that? It's set in Bexhill. So anyone from Bexhill? Woo! Um, the central plot is that everyone in the world has been infertile for 20 years, and the human race is running out of hope. And there, and there is one woman, and I can't remember why, but she's pregnant, and she's trying to flee the authorities. And so this whole, whole story is this kind of dystopian future where, where people can't have babies anymore. And the human race is running out of hope. But did you know that the human race is on the verge of extinction? I'm not talking about politics or war or climate change at the moment. All I'm saying is that it would take everybody in the world to abstain from sex for the next 50 years and the human race would go extinct. Guaranteed. No second chances. The human race is about to die. Every species of animal is about to die. And so in every generation, there needs to be a restoration of new life. And it's no different when it comes to faith, is it? In every generation, there needs to be a revival of faith. In the UK, the church was in a bad place after the war. Um, and then in the 50s and 60s, Billy Graham and others had tours around the country, missions, which revitalized the church and brought the church back to faith. And that spun off Christian camps and festivals and church plants, even whole new denominations of the church. And God used the Billy Graham meetings and other things then to bring new life to the church right across this country. But the generation of people who came to faith in those days and those subsequent movements, that generation is retiring now and looking to pass on the baton of leadership in the church. 
And there is a massive lack. I was talking to a couple of pastors last night. There's a massive lack of people waiting to step up and lead. There are heaps of people who love coming to church because they've lived off someone else's faith for years. They love going to a good church where they feel like they have a good relationship with God because they're under the leadership of an old pastor who actually does have a relationship with God. Church, the church of Jesus Christ is on the verge of extinction in the same way that the human race is on the verge of extinction. Without new life in every generation, without a restoration or revitalization, without a revival of faith in Jesus, the church will die. And in every generation, we need a fresh move of God. The gospel needs to be preached afresh in every generation. You've heard, potentially, that God has no grandchildren, that you're either a child of God or not, that there is no plus one to the ticket of salvation. There is no plus one to the ticket of salvation. We need to see God's spirit at work in every generation. And so then the last thing I want to talk about is this. And hopefully I'll have my notes straight before we get there. I think we've got five minutes, that will do. The last thing I've got to say is this, that we need a fresh move of God in every generation. But what does waking up look like? What does waking up look like? Verse 3 says, remember what you have received and heard, hold it fast, hold it as infinitely valuable, hold it as tight as you would if you held your phone out of a car window, hold your faith fast and repent. And repentance is central to a Christian life, a healthy Christian life. Remember what John says in his letter, if you think you are without sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in you. Remembering and repenting then are the two central disciplines of an individual's prayer life. But I want to suggest that remembering and repenting are not just individual things this morning. The letter to Sardis wasn't written to individuals, but to a community. The, the, letter, the issues of repentance and remembrance are primarily communal before they are individual. Sardis was called to l- repent for living off a reputation for faith rather than a real trust in God. And I would pray that HHBC never has to repent for trusting our reputation. And I would pray that for each one of us here, we would never hear Jesus say, You didn't trust me. Alluding to the fable of the hare and the tortoise, I don't know if my parents ever told me that story, but I heard it from somewhere. Probably my grandma, she used to tell those sorts of stories. It's a story that inspires people to keep going no matter how slow they are and reminds people not to get too proud if they're racing ahead. And I learned that story from the community that I was raised in. And that story on its own is a little bit important in holding society together. It has a role. Well, the role of remembrance is a similar community-based thing. We need to continually tell people stories that remind us of our identity in Christ. We need to hear stories of people coming to faith. We need to tell stories of Christians down through the ages. Um, I have a friend who's a Coptic priest in New Zealand, This is a church largely based out of Egypt with ministry to Egyptian and culturally Arabic Christians around the world. And I was at his church a few years ago, and he was amazed that I knew the heroes of the faith that were depicted in paintings on the walls or icons. Cyril, Athanasius, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, and many others. He was amazed I knew about them because he doesn't think the Western church does a very good job of telling stories of the heroes that built the church over the last 2,000 years. I think he's largely right. I don't think we know our history. I don't even think that many of my peers would know the stories of those people that painted on the walls of this church. We don't all have to become historians, but we have to become people who tell stories of faith. And ultimately, the story of communion that we come to in a moment is the greatest story of faith, isn't it? It helps us to remember that story of Jesus laying down his life, trusting the Father, that the Father would use his sacrifice to give us a clean slate. Or in the image of the letter to Sardis, trusting that God would use Jesus' sacrifice to give us clean robes to wear and to join Jesus in his great party, the magnificent community of heaven. And we tell this story of of communion when we come together, because although God knows our name, 
Jesus is the name that we need to know. Jesus is the name by which we are saved. Jesus is the name above every name, and it's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So God knows your name. He knows you're sleeping, and he has a story of faith to wake you up. Let's pray. Father, as we hold your word in our hands and as we um, reflect on the challenge to wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to perish, we pray that you would speak to us and awaken that faith in our hearts once again. For your sake, for the sake of this church and for the sake of this community, would you awaken hearts to faith once again. Amen. We're going to hold a minute's silence now. And this links very well to what the, church, the letter to Sardis teaches us. God knows your name, he knows you're sleepy, he knows the story of faith that will wake you up. The story of Jesus that will wake us to life. And I have no personal connection at all to um, the military, but I have a deep connection to the act of remembrance. Because laying down your life for the sake of the other, you're modeling the sacrifice that Jesus made. So we will stand together in a moment to remember those who across two world wars and multiple localized conflicts since. Those who have laid down their lives for the sake of the freedom of others. Let's stand together. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. Our God and Father of all, remember your holy promise and look with love on all your people, living and departed. On this day, we especially ask that you would hold forever all who have suffered during the war, those who have returned scarred by warfare, those who have waited anxiously at home, those who returned wounded or disillusioned, those who mourned, and all of our communities that have been diminished and suffered loss. Remember, too, those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their lives for their comrades, and those whom, in the aftermath of war, worked tirelessly for a more peaceful world. And, Lord, as you remember them, remember us. 
O Lord, grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when every people of every language, race, and nation will be brought into unity under Jesus Christ. We ask this in the name of that same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, We will remain standing as we sing our next song before we take communion. Please have a seat. Um, we're going to take communion now. Um, I'm really excited to do this, um, but particularly I want to welcome a few folks to the table before we do so. Young people, welcome back in. Really great to take communion with you this morning. Um, communion we share and we take because we believe that Jesus has died for us and broken, and, and the bread represents his body that's 
broken for us, and the, blood, the, the wine represents his blood that's shed for us, and that as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we kind of become part of the saving work that Jesus has done for us. And so if you want to do that, please feel free. It will be passed around, and feel, anyone feel free to join in and t- take the bread and take the wine, and we hold on to the wine and drink it together at the end. But please f- feel free to take it, but equally feel free to let it pass you by if that isn't someone that isn't something that you would want to say for yourself at the moment, that you don't feel like you're one with Jesus and you don't want to be involved in that, feel free to, to let that pass you by. So welcome, young people. And um, welcome as well to Colin. We voted you in at our last church meeting. I don't know if someone's let you know. Hopefully. But welcome, Colin. Good that you can be with us this morning. And, and particularly, I don't know if there's anyone else that's not been around for a communion service for a while, but I don't think, Doreen, you've been here for a few communion services, have you? So it's been a bit of a journey for six months, but welcome back. <laughs> Doreen's um, been on holiday in a hospital for a, for, a, for a while, and it's great, really great that you're able to come back to be with us this morning. So I've got an invitation. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own that gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would love to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. The Apostle Paul tells us about this meal. And he says this in 1 Corinthians, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that's for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and his ministry, announcing good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its power, lifting up the downtrodden, healing the sick and loving the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death on the cross, for the redemption of the world and raising him to life again as a foretaste of glory that we all share. We thank you. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, that we may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. The words of the Lord's Prayer should be able to appear on the screen behind me, I hope. And we're going to say this prayer out loud together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Um, there should be six people serving communion this morning. If you want to just come up and stand by the table with me, if that's all right. Brilliant. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me.